Luke chapter 17. Luke chapter 17. We've been in a series since our very first Bible study all the way back on June the 6th, 2021. Just celebrated two years a couple of weeks ago. And we're only in Luke chapter 17 <laughs> after two years. And that's okay. We've had some rich truths in this gospel. And I'm so grateful for the word of God and the way that it helps us to know who God is and what he expects of us. And I'm thankful that we have firsthand perspectives of who Jesus is. Because the best way to find out about somebody outside of talking to them personally is to hear from those who knew them personally, those who walked with them, those who talked with him. And so in the Gospel of Luke, we find out of all the Gospels, the most complete and detailed version of who Jesus Christ is. And I've sure enjoyed going through this study. We're going to be in verse number 11 through verse 19 today as we continue and to just catch you up to speed on the context of the book, Jesus is on his way from uh, Galilee to Jerusalem to accomplish his sacrificial death for our sin. And that journey began, I believe it was all the way back in chapter 9. And so as you can tell, Jesus stopped in a lot of towns and villages and ministered to a lot of people on his way to his death. And that's kind of what we've seen. He's been but what Luke has been doing, he's been showing us the opposition coming from the Pharisees, and it's really building the tension up to Christ's death in chapter 22 and 23. And so that's kind of where we're building to, but what we're going to have today is a little bit of a break from him dealing with the Pharisees and dealing with his disciples to minister to the physical and spiritual needs of 10 individuals. So Luke chapter 17, verse number 11. And it came to pass as he went to Jerusalem that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered into a certain village, there met him ten men that were lepers, which stood afar off. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said unto them, Go show yourselves unto the priests. And it came to pass that as they went... They were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back and with a loud voice glorified God and fell down on his face at his feet, the feet of Jesus, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan, a half-breed Jew with a corrupt theological system, turned around to worship Jesus for what he'd done for him. Verse 17, Jesus answering said, Were there not ten? But where are the nine? There are not found that return to give glory to God, save this stranger. And he said unto him, Arise, go thy way, thy faith hath made thee whole. I want to preach to you this morning a message entitled this, Where are the nine? Where are the nine? May God bless the name of his word. You can be seated. We'll consider our text this morning. <clears throat> Over the years, I've had people in my life that have been good to me and my family in extraordinary ways. Now, of course, you expect that from your parents. You know, parents at least like you a little bit. And so they, they like to shower you with blessings and to uh, be a blessing to you and give you good things. We understand all that. And so that's not necessarily what I'm talking about, though I'm so grateful God gave me two wonderful parents. But I'm talking about people that you would not expect necessarily to be so good to you in unique ways. One of those ways I was in college going into my, I was in my senior year coming down to the end of my senior year approaching graduation and I honestly had no idea how I was going to pay my school bill to be able to graduate uh, that year. And there was a man in my dad's church that I met in, I think it was in Christmas break. And that was, he was a new member at the church, first time I'd ever met him, really interesting guy. He'd, he'd play the harmonica right there on the front row. Uh, while while my, my wife was playing the piano, even after we were there, my wife would play the piano. He'd be right there, you know, playing Are You Washed in the Blood with his harmonica. He'd go to restaurants and he would play hymns for people with his harmonica. Just a really neat single old man. 
And uh, I, got a, I got a card in the mail one day, my last year of college, my last semester there. And in that card was a check for $777.77. <laughs> that seems a little bit OCD. But if you know your Bible, you know that the number seven is the number of completion, the number of perfection or maturity. And he just had two words written on that card, finish strong, Ted Carr. <laughs> and uh, I, I got that check and I was just blown away. This is a man I never met before, except for one time at Chris's break. And, and yet he cut such an expensive check for me and I was able to use that to help pay off my school. Plan. It was a remarkable thing. I'm so thankful for that. After my wife and I, uh, we were engaged after I graduated and then we got married about a year later. And uh, we were, if we could say this way, dirt poor. <laughs> we both had, I was working just a part-time job, working as a youth pastor. The church was taking care of our housing, but I was making like 9.83 an hour uh, for Sherwin-Williams Paint Company back in, this would have been 2012. And so not a lot of money there. My wife was working at a daycare. You know, there's not a lot of money in that either. And so we were just poor as could be. And so for our honeymoon, we were just kind of planning on taking a few days in a cabin down in Colorado Springs and just spending some quiet time there together. And one, another member of my dad's church, um, they said, yeah, that's, that's not gonna fly for me. <laughs> And uh, they said, they said, you tell me where you want to go and we'll make sure you get there and you can stay there. And I was like, forever? <laughs> no, I'm just teasing. Uh, but uh, they, they ended up paying for a lot of our honeymoon. And we were able to go to San Diego, California. It was my wife's first time there. Obviously, you can tell that's kind of a special place uh, for us. And so we got to go down and spend a week there. We were able to do Disney. We were able to do SeaWorld. And much of that trip was at the expense of a very generous member. They were so good to us. Well, as my wife and I were married, we lived in a condo owned by that same family in Niwot, and, and uh, the, the church, they were renting it out pretty cheap for the church for us to be able to live in, and they had adopted a bunch of kids, and so it was getting more and more expensive here. Their house was shrinking because their family was growing, and they decided to sell their properties. They both had condos from when they were single, and then they bought this house together when they got married. And they decided to sell these properties, move to Georgia, and be able to have a place that would be more space for them and their kids. And so we were really up in limbo. It was like, okay, well, I don't know where we're going to live at this point. We just have like a couple months here to try to figure this out. We don't make, again, a lot of money. The church isn't huge. The church was only about 100 people at that time. And and so uh, I say that now, you know, after COVID and everything, it's about 35 people. But it was 100 at that time. Um, and so we didn't really know what, what we were going to do. And that family called me, the owner of that condo called me and said, Hey, we, we ended up making so much off of those other two houses. We just want to sell you that condo for what we owe on the mortgage, which is only $59,000. And, uh, as you can imagine, my jaw fell to the floor and I said, what? <laughs> and they said, yeah, we, we want to do that for you. We realize God's called you to Boulder. This was all the way back then, 2012 or 20, 2015 when this happened. So we realize God's called you to Boulder and we think this could be a help to you because we know Boulder's not cheap, <laughs> if you know that. And so it was an amazing thing. That's really the only reason why we can live in the house that we have today is because of what that family did for us eight years ago. That was extraordinary. I mean, how many of you think of how our, our market has boomed? Let me just throw out a number out there. If somebody dropped 200 grand in your lap, <laughs> that'd be extraordinary. Some of you would say, can I tap into that some? Can you give me that family's phone number? <laughs> but uh, it, it was an amazing thing. It was extraordinary. When somebody does something like that for you, I mean, you, you, you want to do something back for them. And most oftentimes when people are that generous and that good, they don't want anything back from you. They just say, no, we just want to be a blessing. And so you go and you fill out your thank you cards and you're going to send them a thank you card. And as you sign your name, you're like, this piece of paper that they're going to open and probably discard in the garbage, this just seems so cheap compared to what they did for me. 
And you want to just go around them and throw your arms around them and hug on them and weep. And you want to fall down to their feet and kiss their feet. Maybe not literally, but in the spiritual sense, you just want to express your love and your gratitude when somebody is that good to you. Can I tell you that nobody has done anything more extraordinarily good for you than our Lord Jesus Christ? We are unholy people. People who are unworthy to stand before a holy God, unworthy of entrance into his heaven, unworthy of the ability to pray and to talk and converse with him, unworthy to even stand in his presence. We've seen in our study in Exodus on Thursday night that God's eyes are so holy he cannot behold man's evil, and man's eyes are so evil that we cannot behold God's holiness. And yet when Jesus saw us in our pitiful condition, he came from heaven to this earth and he lived the life that we never could and he died the death that we should have died and he shed his blood on the cross so that we could be forgiven, so we could be cleansed and washed from our every sin and find acceptance as an unholy person in the eyes of a holy God. And it's not because we are holy, it's because we've been made holy. The filth of our sin has been washed off us completely by the blood of Jesus Christ. When we could not help ourselves, he came to our rescue. He's worthy that we would throw our arms around him. He's worthy that we would weep upon his shoulders in gratitude and humility. He's worthy that we would fall down on our face before him, acknowledging our unworthiness and his supreme and infinite worthiness. He's worthy that we would worship him, that we would praise him, and that we would live our lives for his highest glory. That's what he is worthy of. He dropped something way greater than $200,000 in our laps salvation, eternal life. He made us joint heirs with the Son of God. You know what that means? If you're saved and you're struggling financially today, you just keep hanging on because it's all coming. <laughs> And he's going to back up that truckload when you get to heaven and he's pour out the riches of his grace and pour out the riches of his bank account and he's got a mansion for you and you're going to live in heaven like you were never able to live on earth. And you're going to do it in his presence. That's what he's done for us. And he's worthy of our worship. And yet, there are so many Christians, particularly in America today, who would be so bold and brash as to say, it doesn't matter that I go to church. It doesn't matter that I sing. It doesn't matter that I pray. It doesn't matter that I worship. There are so many Christians who won't fall on their knees before God. It's too embarrassing. It's too, it's too much of a show in their minds uh, to go and fall down on your face before God. There are so many Christians who would rather be in the mountains. So many Christians who'd rather be at the Rockies game or at the Broncos game. There are so many Christians who would say this, thank you, Jesus, I'm saved. Now I'm just going to go live my life however I want. And what I'm telling you is this, that is insulting in the eyes of a God who loves you and gave himself for you. And we're left to question this in churches. Where are the Christians? Where are the Christians? Why are churches so small? Why are churches struggling to grow? Why do some Christians get saved and then never get baptized and never follow the Lord and never go to church and never worship before the, 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 before the God of heaven? Where are the Christians? And yet that was happening 2,000 years ago when Jesus was walking on the earth. We read in our text, he cleansed 10 lepers, 10 lepers, and only one of them returned to give glory to God and to worship at Jesus' feet. And Jesus posed the question, where are the nine? Where are the nine? 
And by his question, it clearly suggests that the nine others should be in the same place as the one, and that is on their face at Jesus' feet, worshiping, praising him, and thanking him for the difference that he had made in their lives. And yet Jesus was left to ask, where are the nine? But his rebuke of those nine men was also a commendation of the one. Why did Jesus see it so appropriate that this one man, this Samaritan, this one that didn't have all his spiritual bearings about him, this one who didn't have the correct theology, the one who wasn't a pure Jew who had the law in his hand, uh, the, the, the history there of being only from Abraham, uh, why is it that this one man was commended for turning around and worshiping Christ? What I want to do today is I want to show you why we come to church, why we come to worship, why we come to sing his praise, why we come to magnify his name, because I want everyone that comes to Boulder Valley Baptist Church to understand that church is not an option for a Christian. Church is a necessity for a Christian, and church is what God is worthy of. Do we realize what a church is? This building is not a church. The church is you. So when I say we come to church, why do we come to church? I'm saying why do we gather together as a fellowship of believers? Why do we come to sing? Why do we come to pray? What is it that makes Jesus worthy of our time every Sunday and even beyond Sunday? What we find here is that Jesus is making his way from Galilee uh, to Jerusalem, and he comes through the area of Samaria, which most Jews would have gone around because there was a lot of hostility between the Jews and the Samaritans because the Samaritans were half-breeds. They weren't full-blooded Jews. They were... They were um, when the Assyrian Empire had taken the northern tribes of Israel captive, they ended up replacing and, and relocating some of the Jews back to northern Israel, but they also relocated some of their other captors, like whether, whether we're talking about Ethiopians or we're talking about Syrians, relocated them to this northern region, and they began to intermarry, and they began to mesh their religious systems together, and so there was a lot of hostility between this group of Jews and full-blooded Jews. And yet Jesus chose to go right through that area. And what that shows us and what Luke's drawing our attention by pointing out Samaria and the fact that this was a Samaritan man who returned to worship is this. God's work is not limited to the Jews only. His work is for everyone. And so Jesus is making his way and he comes into a certain village in verse 12 and it says that he met 10 men who were lepers Leprosy is an awful disease of the skin. The Bible word leprosy can refer to a variety of skin diseases, but the most common that you would see is what we refer to today as leprosy. And the way leprosy works is that it would cause, the disease would cause people to lose feeling in their nerve endings of their extremities. And so they couldn't feel their fingers. And so what happens is when they are, you know, splitting wood <laughs> and their fingers in the way, they don't feel that. <laughs> and that when they're hammering a nail, pff, they don't feel anything. I mean, could you imagine you're holding a nail and you don't even know where you're holding it or can't see where you're holding it or, or feel where you're holding it and you just go, pff. I mean, I've smashed my finger with perfect feeling and it hurts bad. What happens is their lack of feeling in their legs and their feet and even their nose and their ears it would make it to where they were constantly injuring themselves. I mean, plowing into things, falling over, smashing their fingers, smashing their noses into doors and things like that. And so they would, they would damage and injure themselves so badly that eventually they would just begin to lose their extremities. They would lose fingers. Their, part of their nose would come off. Part of their feet or their legs would come off. I mean, it was a horrendous disease. It came on by boils, rashes, uh, scabs and, and, and other oozing infections of the skin. It was very infectious. 
And so because of that, God included specific instructions for how they were to handle these type of skin diseases. That what happened is if you were seen to have some kind of boil, you were to go to the, uh, the tabernacle or the temple and you were to show yourself to the priest. The priest was to inspect it and then you were to isolate for seven days. And, and after seven days, you would come back. And if he takes a look at it and he sees no change in it, then you need to isolate for another seven days. And so you got 14 days of quarantine. Remember that? <laughs> 14 days of quarantine. And then they would come back. And if there was no improvement, no change, they were declared to be leprous and unclean. They would have to pack up their belongings. They would have to leave their family. Their family would have to take the clothes and the bed and they would have to, they would have to burn it to a crisp. They would have to uh, tear out some of the walls if they found the, uh, some of the infection on the walls. And I mean, it was a big ordeal to be able to stop this spread. The leper would take all his belongings. He would have to leave the city and he would have to live outside the city in a leper's commune. They were viewed as outcasts. They could only interact with people who had the same condition as them. And when they came across somebody who was healthy, they had to cover their upper lip and they had to cry out, unclean, unclean, so that people would maintain their distance from them. It was a very sad situation. What I want to point out about leprosy is that leprosy was a great equalizer in their day. It didn't matter if you were a Pharisee or if you were a murderer. If you got leprosy, you ended up in the same situation. It didn't matter if you were rich or poor. It didn't matter if you were black or white. It didn't matter if you were a master or a slave. Whoever you were, if you got leprosy, you ended up grouped in with this commune of lepers in the same exact condition. Now, I realize that not many of us deal with leprosy today. But the reality is that when you look at the Bible, the Bible pictures leprosy often as a portrait of sin in our lives. And sin is the great equalizer of humanity. Because it doesn't matter if you are rich or poor, you're a sinner. It doesn't matter if you're the president of the United States or if you're a delivery driver, you're a sinner. It doesn't matter if you're the most spiritual among us, if you're a pastor of a church or if you're a first time visitor, you're a sinner. All of us are sinners. The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. It's the great equalizer. It brings us all to the place where we realize our greatest need in life is to be cleansed of this decay in our lives, and that decay is sin. These men, they were all, ten of them, grouped together from different backgrounds, different lifestyles, different classes of society, uh, different nationalities as we see. The implication is that nine of them were Jews and one of them was a Samaritan, but they were all grouped into the exact same situation and they all needed the exact same remedy. And so Jesus is coming by and perhaps these men have tried every single thing that they could. They've tried all the cures. They've tried all the medicines. They've tried all the essential oils. I mean, they've gone through every natural and unnatural remedy that they could possibly go through, and nothing provided a cure. It had to be a miracle. And they hear about Jesus coming by. And they had heard that Jesus had power over disease and Jesus had power over blindness and over crippledness and he had power over demons, even legions of demons. And they had heard all of these things about Jesus. And when they see Jesus coming by them, they cry out, Jesus, master. This word master is different than what we normally see. We normally see master as a teacher or a rabbi, but this word master means commander in chief. <laughs> They're acknowledging Jesus to be of supreme authority. And they say, we've tried everything else and that's all failed. But we know is this, if Jesus will heal us, we will be healed. And so what they cried out for, they kept their distance like they were supposed to. And they cried out, have mercy on us. When you cry for mercy, here's what you recognize. This is something we don't deserve. There's an ounce of humility here in them where they're saying, we don't deserve you to come near to us. We don't deserve you to touch us. We realize the condition that we are in. And many times they view leprosy as a judgment for gross sin in their lives. <laughs> so more than likely, all these men recognized that they had been in the situation they were in because of their sin. And they said, we know we don't deserve it, but would you have mercy on us? 
Jesus sees them. Can I point that out to you? Jesus sees us in our decaying condition. His eyes behold us and sees the suffering and the anguish that we go through as a result of sin. And he saw the pain and the suffering, the disfigurement of their faces and the disfigurement of their fingers. And maybe they were missing a leg and maybe they were missing a foot. And he saw them in this pitiful, pitiful condition and he had compassion on them and his heart went out to them. And here's what he said, go show yourself to the priest. That's a little melodramatic. You'd think Jesus would say something like, be cleansed. You'd think Jesus would, would do something like he sees this guy doesn't have a hand and he'd come and touch and pfft. You'd think there'd be something like that. But what Jesus says is go show yourself to the priest. Now, showing yourself to the priest is what you would do once you were healed. So as they're looking at it in their disfigured, leprous condition, it's like go to the priest. We go to him. He's going to say, get out of here. There's no difference. You're the exact same as you were before. So go out and scram and get outside the city and keep crying out unclean and keep your distance from people. That's what would make the most sense. But yet you see the measure of their faith in this simple fact. They went anyways. They knew what it was going to be, and yet they still chose to go. And you know what it says? As they went on their way, perhaps they were talking, conversing, and this dude had, you know, maybe only one finger. And he looks down at, at, at his hand and, he, you know, he's talking with his hands and he's seeing him talking like this the whole time. And then all of a sudden it's like, <laughs> and he's like, ah, look, you know, can't even say it. Look at your hand. And the guy's like, ah, and he said, look at your nose. Your nose is back. Thank goodness. Cause you were an ugly fellow, man. I mean, these, these dudes were, you know, living together here for a long time. They were probably like brothers more than anything else. And they begin to point these things out. They got toes growing back, nose growing back, ears growing back. Their skin is clearing up. There's no boils. There's no scabs. It's, it's, it's just like they were babies again, perfectly smooth, healed skin. And they, and they are like, it happened. <laughs> He healed us. Hey, let's go to the priest. Let's make sure that we can uh, get back to normal life again. I mean, what Jesus had done in these men changed their lives forever. They were never the same. They, these men were able to go to the priest, and once they're declared clean, I mean, they go and they say, hey, we were lepers. Do you see any leprosy? The priest would be like, what do you mean you were lepers? You weren't lepers. Yeah, it's, it's me, you know, and his face was so messed up or so wrapped up, bandaged up. He tells him what his name is, and he's like, really? How did, this, how did this happen to you? Jesus, am I clean? Yeah, go on back. And he goes, oh, I can't imagine. He walks through the city gates for the first time in 20 years. And he walks up. I don't know if he was like, I wonder if my family still lives in the same house. And he goes up and he knocks on the door just in case. And maybe their 15-year-old kid is now 30 years old living with mom still. <laughs> and uh, he comes up there and sees him and he's perfectly healed. I can't imagine what that'd be like. They haven't touched anybody in a decade and they wrap their arms around them, or maybe, maybe the, the kid sees them and wraps their arms around them. Comes to his spouse, he can kiss his wife, he can go back to his job, he can sleep in his bed again, and, and he's completely restored to his family. He can go down to the temple and he can offer sacrifices with his family, and he can be restored to worshiping God. I mean, their lives were absolutely changed forever. And it's at this point that our attention is drawn to their responses. It says that only one turned back and glorified God. <laughs> you know what this word glorify means? It means to praise. What it means is that this guy, after he sees this is healing and they begin going their way and he said, you know what, this isn't right. 
This isn't right that I would just go on, see the priest, and go live on my life as though nothing ever happened. No, I've got somebody to thank. I've got somebody to praise. I've got somebody to worship. And he turns back and he begins, oh God, thank you for healing me. You've changed my life. I'll never be the same. Everything is different now. I get to see my wife. I get to see my kids. I don't have to cry unclean anymore. I don't have to have these bandages on my face anymore. I don't have to live out in the streets with the homeless people anymore. No, I am clean. Oh God, thank you for what you've done in my life. And he's praising and he's rejoicing and he catches a vision of where Jesus is and he comes to Jesus and he falls down on his face at his feet in worship. I needed mercy and you gave it to me. I needed healing, and you gave it to me. I needed restoration, and you gave it to me. I needed to go to the temple of prayer, and you gave it to me. I needed to go and give my sacrifice to God, and you gave that opportunity to me. And he's groveling at Jesus' feet, praising him and thanking him and worshiping him for what Jesus had done in his life. And this man was a Samaritan. A man who had very loose ideas about God man who didn't worship according to the word of God. And yet, he had enough spiritual senses about him to say this, when somebody does something extraordinarily good for me, I gotta go and throw my arms around him. I gotta go and fall at his feet. I got to worship him. I gotta praise him. I gotta thank him. And he does just that. And look at Jesus' response to this in verse 17. And Jesus answering said, Were there not ten cleansed? But where are the nine? There are not found that returned to give glory to God, save this stranger. It's, it's almost like Jesus is dumbfounded by this. I can't believe this. I, I healed 10 lepers, changed their lives forever, restored them to their families, restored them to society, restored them uh, back to being able to worship God, and yet only one came back. Where are the nine? They all should have returned and worshiped him, but only one did. And look at verse 19, and he said unto him, Arise, go thy way, thy faith hath made thee whole. When you see that phrase, made thee whole, it's one of Luke's favorite words to use in his gospel. It's the Greek word sozo, which is the same word translated saved. <laughs> saved. Jesus said, arise and go thy way. Notice he doesn't say, go show yourself to the priest. What Jesus is saying there is this. When I have declared you clean, you don't need a human priest to declare you clean. Can I just throw that out there today? That when Jesus Christ saves you, when Jesus forgives you of your sin, you don't have to sit in a confessional booth and confess your sins to some man priest who is a sinner. No, when Jesus says you're clean, that's all that you need. <laughs> He says, you're clean. Go thy way. Your faith has saved you. You've been saved by faith. What this text shows us is really this truth. That Jesus commended the Samaritan leper for returning to worship him because the appropriate response of the cleansed is to give worship to the cleanser. That's the truth. The appropriate response of those who have been cleansed by faith in Jesus Christ is to give worship to the one who has cleansed them. Now, if you're in here this morning, I don't think, I'm, I'm not aware that we have anybody in our church dealing with leprosy right now. <laughs> I don't know that, you know, maybe we have a candidate, I guess, but not really. Uh, but here's the truth of the matter. All of us are still in need of cleansing. Why? Because of our sin. 
Because our sin separates us from God's family. Our sin keeps us from worshiping God. Our sin alienates us and estranges us from God. And not only that, our sin has a decaying effect on our lives. Our lies, our lust, our greed, our anger, our bitterness, all of those things have a decaying effect on our lives. Lust can plunge you into a bottomless gutter. Anger is like a wildfire that spreads rapidly and destroys everything in its path. We know a little bit about that here. That's how anger works. It destroys families. It destroys marriages. It destroys work relationships. Anger destroys churches and tears it apart at the seams. I'm telling you, anger is a destructive fire that destroys everything in its path. It decays in your life. Bitterness and hatred has a decaying effect on you, and it can send you into this world of depression and anxiety, and it can send you into a world of darkness where you feel like walking away from your family, walking away from it all, and perhaps even ending your life. It's decaying. Greed is a decaying effect in your life. It can cause you to compromise on your integrity and do shady things at work. It can lead you into a a, a gambling addiction that ends up sending you and plunging you into uh, poverty and debt. I'm telling you, when we have sin in our lives, it decays. And above all of those things, what our sin does is it keeps us at bay from God. It keeps a chasm and a distance from us to where we are so unholy, we cannot stand in the presence of a holy God. And God is angry with sin, and he has wrath against sin. And the reality is all of our sin condemns us and equalizes us to the same judgment in the same place for the same infinite amount of time. We're talking about eternity in hell. That is the just judgment for our sin. And the only way to escape that is a miracle. A miracle that doesn't come from man. A miracle that comes from God. A cleansing that washes away the filth of our sin and clothes us in a righteousness that is righteous enough and a holiness that is holiness, holy enough and a purity that is pure enough. We all need to be cleansed. And the good news is that God has offered the cleansing through the fountain of blood that was broken and spilled forth on the cross of Calvary so that all who would trust by faith in the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ Christ can be saved, can be made holy, can be made clean though unclean and though unholy. God can see us through Christ in ways he could never see us without Christ. That's what he's done in our lives. And there might be some of you who have been cleansed in your life and God has made a difference in your life and you may bear some of the marks of your past. You'd be totally embarrassed if the church family knew about who you used to be. You'd be horrified if they knew about how abusive and how angry you used to be. You'd be embarrassed if they knew the movies and the TV shows that you used to watch or the websites that you used to browse through for hours. I mean, you'd be horrified if we took this projector screen and laid out every secret thought that you've had and the the crime that you committed that landed you in jail or landed you in community service. If we just put it up there and played it on a screen, you would bury your head in shame because of where you've been. But by the grace and mercy of God, you're a different person today. You're no longer the abusive father that you used to be. You're no longer the absent father that you used to be. You're no longer the embittered wife that you used to be. God's given you victory over that, and Christ has washed you away from that bitterness. And and you're not the same addict that you used to be, shooting up and smoking up everything that's under the earth. Uh, your, Your life is completely cleaned up, completely changed. You may not be perfect by any means, but you're certainly not as angry as you used to be, and you're not as lustful as you used to be, 
He's given you victory and cleansed you and made you holy and acceptable before God by your faith in Jesus Christ. It's not because you started going to church. It's not because you finished a program. It's not because you turned a new leaf. It's because somebody introduced you to Jesus and Jesus changed your life forever. And now you're working on restoring your relationship with your adult kids. And now there's kindness and grace there. And now you're sitting in church again where you never thought you would before. Maybe you got baptized and joined a church and followed Christ in a way you never thought you ever would. You were a mess and you were cleansed and now you're different. And what this text tells us is this, the appropriate response of the cleansed is to give worship to the cleanser. <laughs> every Sunday morning and every Sunday night and every Thursday night to gather together as a church family to sing his praise. Who else would send his son, <laughs> only a holy God, you know why we sing that? Because it's true and because it's borne witness in our lives. And it's because we've been cleansed. It's because we have been forgiven. And so now we fall on our face before God and we lift up our voices before God to give him that praise. Why? Because he's worthy. Because we have been cleansed. We ought to worship the cleanser. That's what we ought to do. And yet, there's so many Christians where we're left asking, where are the nine? Where are the nine? We have some individuals that have been saved at Boulder Valley Baptist Church that don't attend church ever. We have some that have been saved that don't come all the time. They come once in a blue moon. And the question that you might ask yourself, well, if it's a different 17 people every week, maybe I should just be part of that revolving 17. <laughs> maybe I should uh, go up to the mountains this Sunday. Oh, Lord, help us. Lord, help us not to be like those nine who would just go on and enjoy everything God has given us without enjoying the God who gave it to us. God, help us with that. There are some who say, well, I got season tickets with the Rockies and they're playing right after church and I won't get there in time if I go to church, so I'm gonna go to the Rockies. Listen, it's insulting to God that you would not come and worship him for the extraordinary goodness that he has showed to you? How much more insulting is it if you would miss the worship time to go and watch a team who gave up 23 runs in the first four innings yesterday? <laughs> or to go to a Broncos game who wishes they could score as many points as a baseball team just did yesterday? I'm being facetious here, but when you consider what Christ has done for us for all of eternity. How could we leave Jesus asking, where are the nine? There are not who come to give glory to God, but this one. And he's thankful for that one. And that one man was saved, not just from his physical ailment, but from his spiritual disease. And he was forever different. Listen, the message is clear, isn't it? The cleansed should give worship to the cleanser. Let me ask you, have you been cleansed today? Or is sin still decaying your life? Is it still destroying your family? Still destroying your future? Does it leave you condemned for all of eternity? Well, the only thing that can get you out of that state is a miracle from God, and the miracle is this, God incarnated in human flesh in the womb of a virgin, miraculously lived a perfect life, 100% man, 100% God, lived the perfect life you never could, died the death you should have died, and shed his blood for your cleansing. He became sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. You can be cleansed. You can be accepted. You can find a place with God for all of eternity, but it will not be on your terms. It'll be on God's terms, and those terms are simply faith in Christ. 
The Bible says if you believe in your heart that Jesus died for your sin and rose again, and if you call upon him for mercy, thou shalt be saved. You can be saved today. Believer, if you're in here today and you've trusted Christ as your Savior, you have been cleansed. <laughs> and some of your testimonies bear witness to that. But let me just ask you, how has your worship been as of late? Has it been so important that you've looked at your cleansed condition and said, I've got to fall at his feet? I can't contain myself. I mean, you can imagine how many times I said, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you when we closed on that condo. We should never let thanking Jesus get old in our lives. It should be fresh. It should be new. It shouldn't be a drag. Hey, listen, if somebody's got to drag you to church or if your pastor has to call you every week to beg you to come to church or if the worship leader has to stand there and say, come on now, let's sing together. If you've got to be pleaded and begged with to worship God or if, you've, if you feel embarrassed for getting down on your knees to worship God, that means something is wrong. Something's wrong. Why? the natural outflow of somebody doing something so extraordinary for you is gratitude. And if we're not grateful enough to come every time we gather as a church family to worship God, something is wrong. You would say something's wrong with me if I never sent that family a thank you note. <laughs> Something's wrong with you if you never said thank you to that man who wrote you that $777.77 check when you were in college. Or your brother who gave you a car when you didn't have one for a dollar. <laughs> uh, there'd be something wrong with me if I did not express gratitude for the extraordinary things people have done for me. How much more when Jesus has done for you what nobody else possibly could do and what you could never do for yourself. How much more should that drive us in gratitude to praise him, to worship him, and to thank him? Faith that saves is faith that worships. And if we come to the place where our heart is not in the worship of our Savior Jesus Christ, we need to go back to the cross <laughs> And we need to remember who we were without Jesus. And we need to remember maybe where we would be without Jesus. And let his sacrificial death drive us to our knees and drive us to church and fill up our soul to where we're not singing. I hope nobody hears me. Only a holy God. Instead, what you're doing. And let's remember, we have lost people here that still need to be cleansed. Uh, maybe not necessarily this morning, but we have skeptics. We have seekers that come to our church and they're trying to figure out what they believe about God. And they're trying to figure out if they really believe that Jesus died for their sin. You know what they need? They need some people who have been cleansed to show up at church and not to uh, kind of keep quiet to themselves and, and make this all just a show of, uh, of going through the motions. They need some that are going to say, Come and behold him, the one and the only. Uh, fall down before him. Worship the holy God. It, let me just ask you this. If I went to a Broncos game and they score a touchdown or run a kickback for a touchdown and everybody's just sitting around kind of like, I got some popcorn. Is that going to convince me this is a fan base? How about in church? We come and we got to drag ourselves into church, dragging our arms because of how hard everything was in life this last week or because uh, it's just become routine or it's just become duty or the preacher's preaching about what Jesus has done for us and we're just sitting there like it made no difference in our lives. What does that say to those who come in and are looking for hope and are looking for excitement and something to look forward to beyond this meaningless life that's wrecked by sin and evil. How does that make a difference if we're not worshiping the God who made the difference in our lives? Folks, we ought to come 
every service with a heart and attitude to worship the cleanser who has cleansed us from all our sin. I want to encourage you in this way. I got convicted about this studying this message a couple weeks ago. That sometimes on Saturday nights, you know, it'd be crazy. We'd be running around like a family doing things. Sometimes we were coming here to set up back when we were doing it on Saturday nights, but sometimes we'll just sit and watch TV and I would just kind of veg out and try to decompress my mind getting ready for Sunday. And God convicted me and said, no, here's what you need to do. You need to go to the cross every Saturday night and you need to consider how your life has been changed and you need to consider how different your life would be without Jesus and you need to spend some time chewing on and ruminating on the gospel of Jesus Christ and the cleansing that he's brought in your life so that when you come in on Sunday morning, Mm, you're ready to explode with gratitude and with gratefulness and worship and praise. God said, Mark, that's what you need to do. And now on Saturday nights, my family goes out on the back porch. We put a fire up in our fire pit. We roast some marshmallows. We have a good family time. But God just led me to tell my kids, okay, Saturday night after 5 p.m., we're all here. We're not going to our friend's house. We're not running around. We're not turning the TV on. We're going to sit here on the fire. We're going to roast some marshmallows. Maybe we'll roast a hot dog or something like that. We're going to sit here. We're going to talk as a family. We're going to read the Bible. We're going to pray together. We're going to give praises for what God's done for us. We're going to pray for one another. We're going to pray for the church service tomorrow and then send the kids to get their bath because they smell like smoke and then put them to bed. And I just sit out there and I just kind of look at that fire with my iPad in hand, going over the message and praying for you and praying for this church and praying for this city. And I can't tell you over the last couple weeks the difference that's made in my heart when I walk into this building to just spend some time on Saturday night reflecting on the goodness of God. He's given me this precious wife and these three beautiful kids. And this, I'm sitting there on the back patio looking at this house it was God. It wasn't me. It's that family that loved us that God used to put us in this place right now. So when you come in on Sunday morning, you're just ready. It's so welled up in your heart that you've got to let it out. It's not hard to get to church when you're doing that. It's not hard to sing, even if you're bad at it when you're doing that. Why? Because you just so love him for all he's done for you. The appropriate response of the cleansed is to give worship to the cleanser. And let's make sure we're doing that every time we assemble together. And you can do that daily in your life. You could have a fire pit every night <laughs> thinking about how good God was to you that day. Father, we come to you this morning humbled by the grace of our Savior, Jesus Christ, and what he's done for us. And I just want to give you glory today. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for calling us into a church family and giving us an outlet to pour forth our praise to our gracious Redeemer. And I pray that you would help every person who attends Boulder Valley Baptist Church to come with a heart full of worship to you. I pray if there's anyone who needs to be cleansed, that they would find that cleansing by trusting Christ as their Savior today. We love you and we thank you so much for what you've done for us. I ask you to speak during this time of invitation and that you would help us to respond to what needs to be changed in our lives. I love you, Lord. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.